is uh, Mario Diaz from UNAM, and he will be continuing talking about contraction of Markov kernels and differential privacy. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, this is the first part, which was scheduled second, but now it is the second part. <laughs> and oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, it's like Star Wars. We were telling in the <laughs> over the coffee. You know, you, you you first know what is the end of the story, and then you start looking at the story. Also, Lalita didn't ask me to put more math, but I did anyway. So hopefully, it's not gonna be terribly bad. So let let, let me take over from uh, from the result. Right, because we are going to look at these pictures and try to get some intuition on how to prove it. So we need to see a little bit of the geometry of what's going on. So we have this uh, projected uh, DPSGD. Basically, you have a starting point with a certain distribution mu naught, and then you are going to iterate using that rule right there. But in uh, in more pictorial terms, it looks like this: you have a point W t minus one. And then what you're gonna do is you take a random batch of size B, although at some point we will see that the batch is not very important. I mean, the batching strategy is not very important. And then you do the update that you have introduced, which is uh, pretty much having grain descent, but it is gonna be clipped, right? I think here is an important aspect of the PSGD that you have clipping. So what is gonna happen, you will have a little bit of size BT here. It's gonna put you somewhere right over there here. And then you are gonna add the standard uh, Gaussian noise, you're going to be somewhere else. And then at the end, you project into this set W that for us is going to be this uh, beautiful circle. So what we prove is that you have convergence, right? I think you have uh, put it very well. Uh, this uh, beautiful results by Ian Shokri and Al Schuller and Paul that the privacy uh, loss uh, parameters, they converge. So even though you can be using the uh, same data, after a small burning period, you converge. I mean, the privacy loss is not the gradient, of course. This is in the hidden state model. If you reveal the gradients along uh, the way, that's going to be a different story. But if you keep them hidden, you will, you will get something convergent. It looks pretty much like this. It, it depends on this uh, probability P, which is the batch size over the sample size. And this data that uh, he related to the strong data processing inequality that we already saw. So it looks more or less like this. I mean, we're going to work with Delta because it's more natural to us, but you can always translate it to Epsilon. I mean, you can uh, numerically at least convert from uh, Epsilon to Delta and the other way around. So, so the way we prove this, as you have already mentioned, is using this uh, couple nonlinear DPI. So if you remember, the first step is taking an update uh, function that depends on a random gradient. Therefore, there is a little bit of randomness in that step because it's coming from the uh, random batch. So we're going to model that is in Markov kernel. So here, what we are doing is we're taking the average over all possible uh, batches of size B. And here I'm abusing a little bit of the notation. I'm putting functions, but it doesn't mean the average as a function. It means the average as a kernel, because we can always think of a function as a kernel that takes uh, a delta W, a mass at W, and put it in a mass at F of W. So you can always think of functions as kernels. That's what we are doing right there, even though it suggests something else. Okay, so as I have already pointed out, the key technical uh, result or the, the important piece that comes somehow from the information theory realm is the following. If we have two neighboring data sets, X and X prime, and we let Psi and Psi prime be the updated steps, this ones, the red ones that I have here, then we are gonna define this uh, K, which is gonna be one step of the PSGD using X, and then we are going to define k prime, which is going to be the update of DPSGD using x prime. And we have the following inequality. The E gamma or hockey stick divergence between k mu and k prime mu is going to be less or equal than one minus p theta. This is the first part with the hockey stick of mu and mu. And then we have plus p theta. Now we call it a uh, couple nonlinear DPI. I mean, nonlinear is pretty obvious because you have this part here, the P uh, theta that it is adding afterwards. And couple, because typically when you have data processing inequality, you use the same kernel. Here, you don't have the same kernel. Although they are coupled, they share the same randomness. What is the randomness? The batch. The batch is the common randomness. And the only thing that it is different is the X and the X prime. And most of the time they are the same because it is almost the same data set except for one guy. So the way we are going to prove it is in three steps. Uh, I should have a little bit mentioned some of them. 
Uh, the first part is uh, the batching strategy. It turns out that the batching strategy is not very important because you can use what we call the joint convexity of the F divergence. In this case, it's um, hockey stick divergence, but it holds for any divergence. Then we are going to use the strong data processing inequality that you have mentioned. And, and for here, it's very important that we have projection. If you don't have projection, then everything breaks. And this is going to come up later in the talk. And then uh, we will use this neighboring data sets using a coupling argument, right? As I mentioned it, the randomness is shared by this VT. And the only thing that it is different is one data, data, data point. So we are gonna exploit that at the very end. So, well, this is an information uh, theoretic uh, workshop. No, well, what is that? Uh, workshop on information theoretic methods. So we will repeat the method, even though Lalita didn't ask me to do it, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So yeah, yeah. if it is uh, too much, stop me and, and I'm gonna go through slowly and hopefully it's gonna, be, uh, it's gonna be easy enough. So anyway, so we have the definition of psi. You remember what it was this linear combination of the kernels that, that give you one update for one kernel. So we can pretty much plug it to the pi, which is the projection K, G, Gaussian kernel, same notation as you have, and then compose with the updates for these batches, right? So it pretty much is, is transparent. You just plug it here and that's it. Then we remember that our favorite uh, measuring distance between probability distributions, which is F divergences, they are generally convex, all of them. So we can use it for E gamma divergence. In particular, what we know is that the E gamma divergence between uh, the convex combination and the same convex combination is gonna be less equal than the convex combination, which is corresponding to that. So here, what it means, is that pretty much we can take the batch and strategy out. And in fact, uh, we are just talking about uh, sampling without replacement, which, mean, which means taking uh, batches of size B without replacement, but pretty much you can put anything which is kind of independent because it goes out. I mean, at some point you need to compute the probability of using the bad guy, you know, the different guy, but that's, um, but that's about it. So we are gonna take out the batch and strategy here. And then we are gonna use, uh, data process inequality to take this projection out just with coefficient one because I mean typically projections there's nothing you can do with them I mean the contraction coefficient is one therefore uh, there is no strong data process inequality or anything you just take it out they are going to come back again but that's going to be later so the model of this is that we don't need uh, to worry much about the batch and strategy because we have convexity of F divergences. And in fact, this, this was uh, an important part of the proof by Ye and Shokri, uh, but they use the exponentiated Rainy divergence, which is uh, almost an F divergence. So this was already known somehow we are borrowing what they used in a different language and setting. So anyway, um, then the second part is what you have mentioned. Here we call it as constraint. It doesn't matter what it is. What it says, what it means is that you have measures that takes value in a certain set that we call S. Then the Gaussian kernel, the typical latting juice Gaussian kernel, uh, so Gaussian noise with variance sigma is gonna have this contraction coefficient, which is the size of the set, the diameter of S over sigma, that's it. And if you remember this set of epsilon was some Q function, which is the error for the Gaussian uh, distribution and so on. But, that's not very important. So what we are gonna do here is uh, for DPSGD, the way to compute this is we need to understand what happens after you apply the update function, right? It is not just W, you need to apply the update function. So what we prove is the following simple lemma, and actually it's very easy to see it. You have your set W, the worst that could happen is that you start at a post uh, data points. You have W1 in one extreme, W2 in the other extreme. Then the gradient, might want to push you even further away. But because it is clipped and we have the step size eta, well, you're not gonna go very far. Probably you're only get two eta c and that's it. If you are lucky, if you, if you are not, maybe you go even back. So at the end, what you end up is with a region, which is the diameter of W plus two eta c. That's where that uh, magical number came because it's taking some control of that. And therefore, if you remember in this last slide, we had this uh, hockey stick divergence between the Gaussian kernel applied to psi B mu and the same thing applied to psi prime mu. So we can just put the contraction coefficient here and that's it. 
that step is uh, it's done. So somehow here, uh, the model of the story, and again, this is not a new story. We, we did this uh, with Flavio a couple of years ago, and also it's been something that uh, people have been using also in the Rennie uh, differential privacy setting, is that if you have boundedness of certain kind, and then you apply a Gaussian kernel, you tend to make uh, distributions closer. And in information theory, we call that the strong data process inequality. So that's very familiar to us. Now, the last step in this direction is uh, the coupling argument. So up to now, we are pretty much here. If you remember, we had this uh, original holistic divergence. We said, well, we are gonna take the batching out because uh, during convexity. And then we had this theta factor because of the strong data process and inequality. And we are left with this part here. There's still randomness because, well, well, not randomness because now it's fixed, but there's still the batch that we need to take care of. So the way we are gonna do it is a very uh, a simple way is that if they are equal, you know, if psi b is equal to psi prime b, which means you are not using the different data point in x and x prime, then we are gonna bound it using data processing inequality, the regular version that we teach in information theory. So it's gonna be lesser or equal than E gamma, mu, and nu. But if they are different, that happens when you take the data point which is different, we are gonna put a one, okay? I'm gonna come back to that one, but in a minute. And what we can conclude from this is you estimate what is the probability of not using the different guy, this probability one minus P, and what is the probability of using the different guy, the probability is P. That's why you get the B over N. It's just a simple computation. And that's why I said that the batching strategy doesn't matter as long as you can compute what's the probability of having the bad guy in the batch, that's enough. Mm -hmm. Now, up to this point, the analysis seems kind of tight or maybe not tight, but reasonable. The only part that, or at least in my opinion, I mean, maybe, I can get some comments on, on, on what do you think about the tightness of this? But this one looks very lazy, right? I mean, at least I was a little bit annoyed when we found this proof because I said, well, probably here we are wasting a lot. I'm not very convinced. But after thinking it a, a little bit more, uh, it seems that without convexity, it's very hard to improve it. Now, um, probably I'm not gonna explain it, because it takes a little bit of time. But if you grab a piece of paper and a cup of coffee, probably you can convince yourself that in the non-convex case, it's very hard to beat it because one loss function can push the measure mu that you originally have further in one direction. And then the other measure for the other loss function is gonna be pushed further the other way around. So if you want to do it in a classical strong data process in an equality way, you're gonna do it because you will end up with larger coefficients than just one. So it doesn't make a, a lot of sense to try something else there, but I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong because also there is some limit on how much you can push. But anyway, I, I put that, that cup of coffee because I said you can grab a piece of paper and a cup of coffee. And there is a very famous uh, coffee shop near the street, but I get my breakfast every day. It's called uh, Cafe Estrada, which is where uh, Barry Mazur and Ken Rivet discussed one of the important pieces of her maths uh, last year in proof. So, I don't know, it's, it's kind of a touristic place for uh, nerds like, like us, right? So anyway, that's a great place to grab a cup of coffee. How much time do I have? I started at five, right? Now I think, okay, yeah, that's great. So we already talked about the, uh, the projected version, right? We have DPSGD, which is projected, but some might say, well, maybe projection is not very realistic. Maybe you can do uh, something else. Well, this is what we tried. Uh, there's gonna be a similar setting. I'm gonna put a tilde to the node that that is regularized, right? Because we have the projected one, with, which was just the regular W. So to do not uh, interfere with the notation, I'm gonna put a tilde, meaning that it is regularized. And the strategy is pretty much the same. I mean, you start with a point, WT minus one, then you take a random batch. As always, it doesn't matter much. And then the update function has two pieces. Because it's gonna be regularized, we are gonna have a minus lambda here, which typically comes from regularization. 
by the way that here the regularization goes outside the clipping but at least uh, that's the way uh, yeah and shock read this goes for some examples so it's, it's the same thing that we are going to use here so it looks pretty much like this first you have a little bit of regularization that it is pushing you towards the origin. And then you have the update step, which is the regular clipping divided by the number of uh, the size of the batch times eta. And then we add a little bit of noise and we end up in a place like here, right? Now, there's no projection. And we said that in order to have the strong data processing inequality, we need projection because otherwise the contraction coefficient becomes one and actually you can recompile the whole thing without projection, but you get a very bad number and, and uh, it converges to something bigger than one and Delta is always less than one. So there's no point in doing that. And kind of makes sense because if you don't have any restriction, how do you expect to use any of that noise to uh, provide privacy? Here, the key idea to handle this is that if you notice here, I put that zero, but it doesn't matter. I mean, you can put a small uh, neighborhood of zero it's the same at the end. And you have bounded steps. This is step uh, sorry, this update function is bounded by eta C. And Gaussian noise, it is not bounded, but for the most part it is, right? I mean, the probability of a Gaussian random variable between minus 12 and 12 is like one. I mean, it's practically one. So it turns out that if you think about it for some time, you realize that there's like this typicality idea, right, going on. For the most part, you're gonna be in this set, which uh, we are gonna call the ball of radius R T minus one. And because the gradient or, or this uh, updated steps are gonna push you at most eta C and the Gaussian noise is, is gonna push you some constant factor at most, you cannot be very far, right? So it's gonna increase a little bit. How much? Well, eta C plus some constant. And if you continue, eventually you will reach some sort of equilibrium. Why? Because even if the gradient is trying to push you away from zero, and also um, the noise, let's assume the Gaussian noise is, is not very good to you that day and it's trying to push you outside. Nonetheless, you have this uh, regularization part, which is, is pushing you towards the center again. So at some point you reach some sort of equilibrium and you don't go very far, and that's what we call our infinity here. So the idea is going to define a new process that we are gonna call the projected copy, we study that copy, and then pass the guarantees through the regularized version. So the way to do it is very straightforward. You do projections. We have exactly the same thing, but we have an extra projection here, which is going to be projected to some Discs, well, some balls of a certain radius RT. Now, the radius, Sorry. we can play with it. Yes. So, why is it that the noise cannot push you to infinity? Because you keep adding. Well, it can. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Actually, it can push you to infinity, but the probability is very small. The probability is very small, right? Because, I mean, you have regularization. That. So, in order to stay like, I don't know, beyond one million in norm. You need to be very unlucky that the noise is pushing you super hard towards uh, infinity because look, this is growing, right? The W. So the, the, the regularization is always pushing you hard towards the origin. I mean, as far as you get, the, the, the stronger you get pushed back. But you get some sort of equilibrium in that. It's actually what we'll mention part of that in the next slide. You don't want lambda, you want lambda small then. Yeah, I mean, typically you, you want it small. Yeah, but what it's gonna happen is that then this infinity, uh, this infinity region is gonna get larger, which makes sense, right? I mean, when you make lambda equal to zero, nothing is grabbing you towards the origin, therefore the radius just keeps increasing. Okay. So, because that's kind of intuitive. Okay, so we have projection. Now the projection for us is kind of virtual. Right? The idea is that you don't use it much, right? Because otherwise these two processes will be different. I mean, remember the key idea is to study this process and then pass the guarantees to the other one. If you use the projection a lot, then they are gonna be very different. And whatever you say for this is gonna be relevant for the other piece. So what we have to do is make the radius large enough 
so that we don't use the projection a lot, a lot. But you want to make it smaller because you will get a very current, a better guarantee. So we're gonna play a little bit with it. I'm gonna show you how in the next slide. So what we are gonna prove is the following. It looks very ugly. So let me read it carefully. So we have the regularized process, right? So we have training with X that we will call W tilde T and training with X prime, which we call it W tilde prime. Okay, same notation as before. As I have already mentioned, differential privacy is measuring hockey stick divergence, right? We put E to the epsilon, sorry, E epsilon, and we want to understand the distance and income of divergence between those two variables. That's what we want. Now, because in the projected copy, we have projection, we can actually apply what I showed you in the first half. Right? You can have a strong data processing inequality, you take the batch now, you, you do everything, except that now you have some numbers E that depend on the radius because before it was fixed. But nothing changes. And actually this looks a lot like what we had before if you put R equal to whatever number, then this is a geometric series and everything collapses, right? So this is the part, this is what we won by taking the projections. Now we can understand the e gamma divergence between WT, which is a projected copy train on X, and WT prime, which is a projected copy train on X prime, exactly as we did in the first half. Nothing changed. Now, but that's not what we want. We want this part. So the way to proceed is well, maybe we can understand how far these two guys are, how far the projected copy and the original copy are. Well, it turns out that you can compute the total variation distance between those two variables. And it is this factor right here. Now the proof is a little bit of triangle inequality because why not? And I mean, for free, you can get the other one because it is just changing X for X prime that's in material. And finally, you need to put everything together. Now, a little bit more triangle inequality but now it's for the hockey stick divergence. There is a, a very nice triangle inequality for hockey stick divergence that uh, at least I got it from Leo uh, Koff on Bertus paper. I don't know if it was known before, but pretty much it tells you that you can do a uh, usual triangle inequality with the hockey stick divergence, but there's a little bit of a price to pay. If you apply triangle inequality, the usual way you should get one plus one here because you are applying it twice. But in that inequality, you need to pay a little bit of the gammas or e to the epsilon in, in this case. So that's why you get the one plus e to the epsilon here. Now, uh, Matthew Block uh, was laughing a, a little bit. Well, smiling, I would say smiling because I always tell this, uh, this joke. I don't know if you heard that um, Giancarlo Rota, a famous professor at MIT uh, doing uh, mathematics and philosophy. He said that every mathematician has only a few tricks, right? And the first time we met, I was telling him that there is people with this beautiful ideas in duality between abstract spaces, that's their trick. Some other people have symmetries, which is something very impressive. I mean, when it works, it works beautifully. I only have triangle inequality. So I gotta do what I gotta do, right? I mean, <laughs> I'm talking about doing what you gotta do, but we could prove with this. There's a mathematician, uh, Mikhail Gromov, who's probably the top geometer of of current mathematics. And I think there's an article about him saying, yeah, I mean, the things that he can do with triangle inequality are, <laughs> so don't, uh, don't sell yourself short. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm gonna take a look, I'm gonna take a look because then, then I get you off. Yeah, because I only do triangle inequality. Yes, So anyway, what we could do with triangle inequality is the following. So we could prove that after t iterations, this regularized the PHGD is epsilon delta t with this delta, which is the delta that I showed in the previous slide. Now, something that I didn't tell you is that we can play a little bit with the R's. I mean, we have another factor here, kappa, because uh, probably you didn't realize I was trying to be fast. So to sneak it in, there is a constant kappa and this works for any kappa. So you can play with that kappa a little bit. If you do the numerical experiments, what you find out is that if you optimize this kappa, you get something of this sort for regularized EPSGD. It's pretty much the same parameters that you have had in the other slide. It's, 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 it's essentially the same thing. And actually, if you compare them, they are a little bit better, which makes sense because you are taking 
the small radius first and eventually they converge to something. And the other one, you have a, a big radius from the start. Here is increasing a little by little. So you get something way better. Now, I have said that we don't have convergence because we don't in the sense of uh, proving it for um, in an abstract manner. I mean, numerically it seems to converge. I mean, if you even go further, it stays the same. But since you have the kappa and you need to move it for each iteration, it's a little bit tricky. So hopefully at some point we will get it. I don't know if it's gonna work because I only have triangular inequality, right? So, but if it works, <laughs> we will have convergence even for the regularized EPSGD. If not, it's just numeric, but it is good numbers. I mean, probably it's not uh, as good as we would like to have, but I think they are reasonable numbers. Quantity which you're raising to the power t. Yeah, yeah, right. But but I mean, you can change it with t, and that's kind of the trick. Mm -hmm. And also, it's very sensitive. I mean, you, you can study this using uh, central limit theorem or large deviations, and you realize that you don't have to move a lot. Right? You are uh, pretty much at the uh, square root of d. D is the dimension of data, and you have to move a little bit in that region. So it's kind of tricky because numbers just start to grow. Also, this has to be very small. Sorry, very close to one or to this be small. So, so this is the chi square between what? The triangular time? Oh, no, no, this, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, this is a uh, chi square uh, variable with d degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. So, like having oh, the Gaussian yeah. squares. Yeah, which makes sense, right? Because we have a Gaussian noise which is moving and we want to keep it in a boundary region. Well, that's pretty much the kappa. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. That kappa basically is telling us where we are chopping up. You know, like, well, we want to chop at minus 12 plus 12, and then kappa is not 12. I mean, we have some ideas on where to take uh, the, the kappa, which is like the square root of z plus minus something, but it's very hard to manipulate because it's hard to run. So, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. But anyway, the point is we get something converted. Uh, just to finish, a uh, final remarks. So, we started. In the hidden state setting, because, well, if you reveal intermediate steps, that's another business. But in the hidden state, hidden state setting, we started both uh, projected and regularized CPSGD. And we showed that the privacy loss or the differential privacy parameters, they converge in the number of iterations. So that means that after the small burning period, you can actually keep training and you won't, you won't suffer of uh, privacy degradation. Now, a key part of this was not using convexity assumptions. And it is not just because we could, but because we needed to. Even if you have convex losses, once you clip them, they are not convex. So we had to uh, find a way out. And the way was um, information theory. So we use this uh, couple nonlinear data processing inequality. And something that, that perhaps is more important than the actual numbers that we got is that it seems like this convergence of the differential privacy parameters is gonna be kind of universal, right? I mean, you don't need convexity, you don't need smoothness. I mean, you need to chop it off at some point in some way, but you don't need it exactly to have a smoothness or convexity or whatever. So hopefully this is gonna be a little bit helpful in um, trying to extend this and showing that more iterative algorithms, they actually converge. The other day I was reading some paper from the Annals of Statistics and they have iterative processes for L1 penalized uh, linear regressions. And it's also iterative, right? And they were having this analysis that the scale would be, well, in those cases, probably some adaptation or maybe inspiration from these ideas would be helpful. So anyway, I'm gonna stop here, I guess. Great, thanks. thank you. Plenty of time for questions. I actually want to start with a question. So, uh, um, uh, how this? So, if you get your bound data, compare it in the convex setting with the bounds by from Shocker and others. Like, how do they compare? Yeah, uh, we haven't done that. That's what we are going to do in the next couple of weeks. Uh, I have a related question. So, what was Shocker using the regularized for? Because they were. It, it, it was, was that a way to still work it out with the convex? To get a strong convexity. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can use regularization to get some convexity. If you have convexity of losses, then you have uh, the quadratic function. You have something strong and convex. So, so that was more or less the period. I mean, here is to keep it under control. But I mean, it is similar to now. Oh, but then going back to Ilya's question, I mean, 
you don't have a strict guarantee that you will never be unbounded. So that, that's the drive. Right? I mean, your delta could be very small. I mean, the, the, the term you're bounding there, the chi-square, mm -hmm. that probability could be very large. Well, we want it close to one, but it could be as small. I mean, it could, could be the bad, the, the bad way. I mean, you can optimize. I mean, that, that's why we don't claim that we, we know convergence for regularized CCD because you need to play a little bit with kappa. Yeah. We need to work a little bit more on that, but I mean, it seems it's gonna converge or at least numerically. I mean, I, I, I can see it converge for small sigmas, right? No, we can for any sigma, right? I, I mean, you, you, you can always appeal to, to large deviations and you see that you should be kind of Converge. And, I mean, it's, it's very subtle, but yeah, I, I mean, probably in a couple of weeks we can have that. So when you when you mentioned nonlinear as um there was there was a couple of uh, papers from from Yuri Polyansky, Hong Wu, and one with they did with Flavio on on uh, the nonlinear as DPIs for various. I, mean, I think that they had, they had this for additive noise channels. But uh, it's still a stronger methodology. The idea is to look at this, uh, what they call the data processing. They call it the, the, the Bruchian curve of the channel. Right? You look at the input uh, divergence, total variation or tail or whatever, and then you compare it against output divergence. You don't necessarily look for linear scaling. You just look for, mm -hmm. for some mm -hmm. nonlinear relationship. Is this something that, that could have uh, also been related to this work or, or uh, no. Is there a difference despite just the appearance of nonlinear in the, in the name? Yeah. I mean, the short answer is, is probably. I mean, I cannot tell for certain, but but that's that that comes to mind, right? I mean, replacing all this strong data processing and equality stuff with something a little bit more sophisticated, which, by the way, the, that I mean, that family of papers are one of my favorite ones. Here, we, we couldn't use it. Well, not yet. Because it's a little bit tricky to set it up. I, I mean, it's range, and, you know, yeah, that's right, that's right. So, so, so in principle, it could, but we need to find. Uh, I mean, to, to do the fine tuning and adapt it. But, but definitely, I mean, that, that's going to be the next thing, right? But I mean, here somehow the, the, the key point, I think, is showing universality of the behavior, and then we are going to set up in a chain. Of, which, by the way, between us, uh, probably somebody in the future. Anyone gets to see this, but I mean, this this came out of after a couple of failures trying to use a nonlinear DPIs in in some other settings. So 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 that's gonna be the next stop. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Um. So I wanted to ask this question, Shaha, but now you have to take my question. Um. So. Uh, I assume those are from theoretical analysis, but if you were to actually validate uh, like privacy guarantee on the trained models, how would you go about that? So, so you mean like, like chicken and Yeah. Probably you should ask me. <laughs> I know you know those kind of questions very well. Yeah, yeah because I, I mean, here, here, here's yeah, I can somehow our main goal was to establish understanding showing another case with different assumptions that still this convergence of the professional language. Yeah. How do you want it that? I don't know. Actually, that's a great lead in for the next talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> 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 